Hello and welcome to the firm Optimist. I'm Micheline Kaur. As many hotels we open today, it's clear that health and safety is our top concern and training is key to this. So there are no surprises for our customers or our employees. Cleanliness is a vital aspect in how we operate, but now we need to make it front and center. With events on hold and food and beverage limited, a safe stay in our hotel rooms is what we have to offer a mainly domestic market. To talk about how we are adapting to a new set of customer expectations and the reopening of our hotel rooms, I'm delighted to be joined by Mary Hall, a specialist trainer from Hallmark Training. And we will shortly be joined by Inez Guerra, Executive Accommodation Manager at the Carlton Hotel Dublin Airport. Um, welcome, Mary. It's so lovely to see you. Tell me, how Thank are you. you? How are you? And what have you been doing during lockdown? I'm very well, thank you. What have I been doing during lockdown? I didn't do all of the things that I said to myself and promised myself I would do, but I've probably never walked or cycled as much in my life. And uh, professionally, I have been reading what and studying what the hotels internationally and nationally are doing uh, to reopen. I have learned how to Zoom. I have attended an international, a couple of international Zoom meetings, and I have watched many national webinars, including your own Michelin. Uh, congratulations, you've had some fantastic guests on. Uh, they were all very informative. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Mary. It's very encouraging. We have indeed had some great conversations and today will be no different. Um, by now, Mary, we've read the Fall to Ireland guidelines and there are good templates in there. However, the feedback I have is that uh, the work required to do the risk assessment across the guest journey and for staff coming back could be unmanageable for smaller properties. Is it a gigantic task? Firstly, Michelle, or Michelin, I'd like to congratulate Falch Ireland. I think they have done Trojan work in the amount of preparation that they have done uh, and uh, presenting the reports and supports that they have for, uh, for the industry throughout the pandemic. So I know I'm biased, but credit where it's due. I'm not going to say that the reopening protocols make for pleasant or easy reading, they don't. The job has been made more onerous, I guess, by the amount of links that they have offered. But, and it's a very big but, those checklists, templates and guidelines really mean that Fall Child have done the heavy lifting for the industry. And it means that the industry can focus on their reopening and on welcoming guests to a safe environment. Is it a gigantic task? Nothing about this pandemic has been easy and reopening is going to be no different, but it's not insurmountable. We are a very resilient industry. We will get there, we will survive, and in a very short time, I guess, we will once again thrive. I agree with you, Mary. It has been a heavy workload for our accommodation sector. And um, I had a comment in from Bianca. Uh, hello, Bianca, from the Herbert Park Hotel. And uh, she's asking, you know, where do we draw the line between being a hotel or a medical facility and maintain that four star feel where staff and guests feel safe, but not falling into a hospital standard look. I mean, these are very challenging customer relationship issues, Mary, aren't they? Yes, uh, and but I think that really, unless you have come from Mars, uh, guests know what to expect. Um, and yes, we have to make sure that, uh, and I was speaking to somebody last night, that we are keeping our guests safe while being very conscious that this is not a hospital. Yes. And it is a very fine, a fine line. It'll be interesting to see how well the industry uh, walk that line. But I think most of them are doing fairly well. Oh, 
we're joined by Inez. I'm absolutely delighted. Now, just one second and I'll let her in here. We were chatting and then we lost her. Isn't that right, Mary? Yes. Nothing like a technical hit. Sure, there isn't absolutely nothing this like happens. It. It happens to the very best. I think it happens on Sky News, so I'm safe enough. Yes, yes. Uh, welcome back, Inez. I'm so sorry. That's no problem at all. It's good to see you again. Inez, how are you? Um, how, what have you been doing during lockdown? Tell me, how have you been? Well, I was probably one of the lucky ones that I was uh, working. I was the carton still open for essential workers. Um, so it was all an experience. I have a very uh, trained uh, managers, one of the best reception managers making uh, making beds and dusting and the conference banqueting manager as well. And I even learned how to drive the shuttle bus. You're driving but, the bus, Inez. <laughs> yeah, so I was able to bring a few passengers, a uh, few of the pilots to the airport and back. So it was so an experience after all this time saying, no, 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 me, I will not, uh, I will not drive and I have to do it. No options. Very multi-skilled, Inez. I'm hugely impressed. Um, and as looking at the uh, advice on the Irish Accommodation Services website, it's talking about, you know, read the guidelines, do the risk assessment, update your SOPs, communicate with your suppliers and organized team briefings and training sessions. Uh, Mary and I were just talking about the heavy workload uh, for anyone reopening this week. Tell me, what stage are you at in the Carlton Hotel? And did remaining open help you to test some of the protocols? Like I say to you, I, we were open, so that helped me at all. Even that I couldn't physically do much in that week because we still we were only the management working, the management team, so we have to do everything in the hotel. But at least my my mind was already in what we need to do to open. I was able to contact suppliers, to put things already in place. I feel really sorry for the accommodation managers that only started last week or two weeks ago because it's a lot of to put in place. Plus, the signage was going to the floor. It's like you were already living that atmosphere that we are starting. Everybody started living today. It was in my advantage uh, to be here and at least to have the to-do list for when I've got the time to start doing things. This is what we need to change. Are you hearing anecdotally, Inez, among your members that many people only came back in the last few days? Yeah, I know a few, because we, we sent our guidance probably two months ago, and I noticed that many didn't got any replies, so I thought probably it's because they are no uh, working. And the, the la there were even few that only start last Monday. So that gives them only five days um, to actually put everything together in place. What I thought, it, you know, you, myself, I remember my assistant, the assistant manager came back a month ago and it came, it took a little while to, um, to realize what it's going to be now. So the staff need a little bit of time um, for them to adjust it to the new changes. And Mary, I was speaking with a hotel owner last week and he told me that they're treating every room as a COVID room and that after spraying the room, um, it's left for an hour, um, stripped, then cleaned, then sanitized and finally sealed. Um, Mary, what's your understanding of best practice? I have read similar precautions that hotels are taking both nationally and throughout the world. As I said to you, I spent quite a bit of time studying what the international hotels were doing. Not being an expert in medicine or health or indeed infectious diseases. When I saw so many hotels were following the fogging and spraying uh, procedures, I assumed that was the way to go. That is until four weeks ago. Four weeks ago, Anna's hosted a webinar with a clinical nurse of infection prevention and control <laughs> and an Ecolab lead technical advisor. Both of them discounted the use of foggers and sprayers for hotels. They recognized that the proven advantage of the foggers or sprayers is that it covers a, a very large area in a short space of time. 
but they still said it wasn't suitable for hotels. They would suggest that the amount of work that you have to do in preparation can be quite arduous. For example, you have to switch off the air conditioner. You have to, the person operating it has to wear full PPE and uh, be trained in the particular use of those machines. In addition, they're not suitable for our mattresses and pillows and they leave streaks. <clears throat> and while streaks can be acceptable in a hospital situation, they probably wouldn't be accepted in our hotel situation. So that was then. That began my query, why are hotels, just a little niggle that maybe the spending and the investment that we were doing wasn't quite necessary. And then I read in the Fault Ireland reopening protocols, <clears throat> there was a link to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC. And they supplied cleaning guidelines for uh, cleaning various surfaces, textiles, toilets, etc., in healthcare settings, non healthcare settings, and general. Now, I have pitched the hotel industry as being the non healthcare sec uh, section. And for the cleaning of surfaces, the only thing that they suggest is neutral detergent and a viricidal disinfectant, or 0.5% hypochlorite or 70% ethanol. So again, no mention of fogs and sprayers. And as you all know, last, I think it was last Friday or Saturday, the World Health Organization produced guidance notes um, in relation to foggers and sprayers. And I'm going to, so that I give you the correct quotation, I'm going, and I'm going to read it. <clears throat> in indoor spaces, routine application of disinfectants to environmental surfaces by spraying or fogging, also known as fumigation or misting, is not recommended uh, for COVID-19. One study has shown that spraying as a primary disinfection strategy is ineffective in removing contaminants outside of the direct spray zones. Moreover, spraying disinfectants can result in risks to the eyes, respiratory or skin irritation and the resulting health effects. So I guess Michelin, to answer your question, the best practice is really to follow the medical and experts advice. Mary, I'm a bit confused because I heard, you know, that rooms would have to be empty for 72 hours and then 48 hours. And I mean, that's all quite manageable as we have reduced occupancy at the moment. But is that a requirement? And Is it 24 hours? Is it 72 hours? Yeah, I was a little bit confused too, but I spoke to a microbiologist and the microbiologist uh, would suggest that the 72 hours and the 24 hours probably arose through the fact that the coronavirus can survive on plastics and stainless steel for 72 hours and up to 24 hours uh, on cardboard. The microbiologist would say that... Um, there's absolutely no reason why those rooms cannot be cleaned as long as the person cleaning the room takes precautions. Our, our, the, the infection, uh, the clinical nurse that you had on, Ines, says that in a hospital setting, they only leave 15 to 20 minutes. And I was reading from um, the IHF's guidelines uh, in how to deal with a room in which they either suspect or a confirmed case of COVID-19 has arisen. And they are suggesting leaving the room if possible for 72 hours. However, I, I, I am assuming that in that case, it's purely because A, they, have the, uh, they probably have the, the facility or the freedom to do so because of their occupancy figures, but also that it's because they are overly concerned about the uh, accommodation or room attendant. It's in their interest that they're doing it rather than medical reasons. But maybe Ines can add to that. 
Well, in regarding the, I am aware that I'll, uh, I will say a lot of hotels bought already uh, foggers and uh, electrostatic sprayers and following the the not, the notes on Friday, my own advice will be to, if they are using them, first of all, to check what components has the chemical, because there is three chemicals that definitely they can have. One of them is chlorine. And secondly, I think, and for me, the more important is stop using them until any other uh, more, more clear guidance are coming. That is a product that doesn't have that all that ingredients, or it is a product, but at the moment you can put people uh, on risk. I think also that the reason why hotels was inquired about these uh, sprayers is more for so the guests all what we are doing for it. You know, I, I think that was more the thought about it, that we want to do as much as we can and show the customer what we are doing. But if we sanitize, the, in a bedroom, the, 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 the worried things are the touching points. Mm -hmm. And if you clean that with a sanitizer that is in the guy, cover all the guidance, you don't need to be worried about uh, uh, a gun or a fogger or anything yeah. because you already have sanitized uh, all the point all the metals really or the telephone or the remote control in a bedroom i think we'll have to name this fog gate it's certainly a huge debate in our industry since as you say mary a month ago and certainly since friday um just want to bring you back on one thing there. Mary mentioned sealing the room, or I mentioned it, I'm not sure. Inez, are you sealing rooms? Yes, when, well, at the moment, as you mentioned, Michelin, because the occupancy is no, uh, is no high. Uh, myself, I normally clean like the rooms from yesterday, I clean it today. Now I'm doing it only now because I have the, I have rooms, enough rooms to, to do it, but will be one point that we have to clean them. Going into the room, uh, if they wear their glove, this mask and their apron, I can't see any worries about to remove linen or anything. When uh, all the room is done, I know one of the first things that came out was the stickers to be put on the, um, on the, on the door, so to say that is, is closed. Myself, um, we have a lot of more things to do now in the rooms and I didn't want to be cleaning glue as well. So what we design is a, a, a sign to hand on the door that say this room has been sanitized. So that when the supervisor has checked the room, the supervisor will put that sign on at, at the door for the guests know that that room has completely sanitized. Very good. And talk to me about supply. Um, again, there seems to be a shortage of disposable gloves and the costs are rising. Um, accommodation services are very much our front line. I've spoken about this a few times and they'll be needing many pairs every day. What are you hearing from suppliers, Inez, about the availability of gloves? And also, are you providing them to guests on arrival? Well, for the guests, we are giving a welcome, uh, the welcome hygiene package that is has, um, so in our, is one per guest. So in the packet will be gloves, masks, uh, wipes, and, um, and a little bit sanit uh, 30 mil sanitizer. So they will have all, all, every single guest checking in will have that. It is a shortage of gloves now, but I suppose that is not only in Ireland, that is everywhere uh, because we need, it's going to be a lot of gloves in accommodation. Every room that they go, they have to change their gloves. So if they have 10 rooms and you have, if you have a hundred rooms, you are already in a hundred pairs straight away. Uh, only for accommodation per day. Um, so it is, uh, unfortunately, as, as well, people complain about the expenses that is that, but we have no option with it. We need to protect uh, our staff as well uh, of getting any type of infection. So at the moment, gloves, aprons, masks is something that we're going to have to invest the money on it. And Mary, talking about costs, uh, I guess we're looking at a lot of increased costs for hoteliers in terms of chemicals, the downtime that we talked about in each room, and the additional people required in public areas. Uh, what are you understanding about the rise in costs? Without doubt, there will be additional costs. In the past, when we looked for the standard of cleanliness, 
the main emphasis was on the visual impact. As long as something looked clean, uh, touched clean, it was assumed that it was clean. But in today's world of COVID-19, looking clean, touching clean isn't enough. We have to make sure that all of the touch points are hygienically clean or contaminant free. That will, without a doubt, um, uh, reduce the number of rooms that house assistants or room attendants can do. Even the fact that they it will take them a little bit of time because the whole procedure has changed. So without a doubt, uh, it will impact on um, staff room ratios. And in some cases, you know, that's not a bad thing. Just before COVID-19, I was doing a lot of training with accommodation personnel and before the lockdown. And I was horrified to discover that there were hotels, a few admittedly, who expected their staff to service and to clean 30 bedrooms in a day, 30 stay rooms. No human being can service 30 stay rooms regularly to any kind of a standard. And at the end of the day, all house assistants want to do is a good job. All room attendants want to do is a good job. And that's not possible if they're doing 30 rooms. But however, if you look at the fact that we have already said that the procedure is going to be slowed down, in addition, or the, the new procedure and the emphasis is, uh, as I said in the past, for example, if I washed a door yesterday and uh, that room was a departure today, unless there was visible stains, I didn't have to do that door. Now, whether there are visible stains or not, that, visible, that door still has to be washed. So it, the increase in the work, it really is colossal. In addition to that, when you take it that the um, uh, house assistant has to unpack the trolley, clean the trolley, disinfect it, disinfect the vacuum cleaner, uh, the caddies, the containers. So the amount of work, absolutely, um, it is, it'll make a great impact on the uh, labour costs. And at the end of the day, as I said, house assistants really want to do a, a good job. And if there are any accommodation personnel listening, I'd like to shout out to them and say, keep up the good work. Well done. You're needed like you've never been needed before. <laughs> It's very true, Mary. And as I see nodding in agreement there about the serviced rooms on request, um, uh, the Shelburne are uh, on request only for stay over rooms. Um, to reduce the number of uh, uh, associates going in and out of any one room. How are you handling stayovers at the Carlton? We have, for example, we have long stays that normally we will have them with the pilots, for example. So we have uh, designed another different sign and reception will explain the long stays at reception. They, will, they have a design in reception and the sign say, uh, please don't, don't enter this room during my stay. So reception will display to the guests, if you don't uh, wish anyone to get to go into your room during your stay, please put this note, this sign at your door. So we know that they don't want anything. If they don't, uh, say for example, if they stay for a week, for five days, we normally will go and we service the room in day three. And for me, if you have all your PPE, I can't see the difference to clean the, the room. Now, if they want, we have, well, I guess that he said, can we get, uh, can I get something or can I empty my beans or something like that? Again, we will get the full PPE, uh, gloves, masks, uh, and an apron and we'll go and empty the beans. So obviously we will ask the guests if they can, if he can please leave the room when we are doing it. Um, but we will do it the, uh, the same way. <clears throat> Mary, <clears throat> excuse me, Mary, you have trained thousands of managers and supervisors in accommodation services across all grades of hotels. And my question to you is around the guest experience. Um, I'm thinking, you know, how we were known for the human touch and now we're known, we want to be known for no touch at all. And um, I heard from Romy Joy, Executive Accommodation Manager at the Shelburne. Hi, Romy. Uh, that while bookings are very encouraging for them in the leisure market, um, the Shelburne always knew 
what uh, the customer wanted. And Romy feels a little in the dark now about how to meet those expectations. So, Mary, how do we moderate the customer experience um, and yet build their confidence? Tricky. Yeah, well, like I said earlier on, I think that the, uh, unless the guests have come from Mars, they are aware of the precautions that uh, people are taking and they value that. I think if we were to go over and hug a guest that have a heart attack, I mean, they would ask us, do we not uh, know that there is a COVID-19 and that we're meant to keep uh, the social distance? Um so, I, I mean, I, I, I think that guests would prefer us to keep our distance. We can still smile with our eyes. Um, but I do think that hotels are doing a great PR job uh, on advising the customers on the precautions and changes that, uh, that they are making. Uh, and rightly so. Much of the extra work and precautions that we are doing, though, are unseen. This in actual fact means that the guest is placing a very high level of trust on the hotel, on the staff, on the procedures. Um, so that trust has to be respected. I think that has never been more important than it is today. I mean, we've always talked about customer care. Now is our chance really to prove it. I was listening to David uh, Collins on the IHI webinar, and he's talked about how promiscuous customers are. He talked about the fact that we, need, we the industry, need customers much more so than they need us. So I think it's a very salient point that we should remember. And incidentally, many hotels are also writing letters uh, with their um, confirmation. I, I would just ask, and I'm conscious of what Greg Manahan said on your show there a couple of weeks ago. He talked about the need for um, positive brand image and, and the consistency of it. So I'm going to suggest if you are sending out a letter, make sure it has been proofread and spell checked. Otherwise, you could do a lot of damage to the hotel. And again, going back to the messages, the videos that uh, the Delata, Hudson Bay, among many others, have, have uh, issued, they're all telling the guests so that there should be no surprises for the guests. But I also think those videos, what I liked about those videos in particular was really was a personal message from the CEO and from the, the various GMs saying, look, we are anxious and waiting and really looking forward to welcoming you to the hotels. And at the end of the day, that's all we want. We've got this, Mary. I think that's a very positive message that is coming out from the industry is that assuring of the customer. Yeah. But, um, and as our customers asking about our, you know, your protocols before they book. Some of them, they do. What I, I will say more before when, when they, when the news came that the hotel's going to open on the 29th, phone calls start happening. And there were few phone calls to see what are you doing or what have been changed. Or, um, but for my experience of the guests that we have, and even you know the ones coming in now today, and they really want to go out and they really want to get to the, to the normal or whatever normality we can have now. People has been we all been in lockdown in an island with me able to move from the house for too long. Um, and it's curious because like we have a few meeting rooms today uh, occupied and um, like we have a sign in the leave only to people in the leave. The first five that they arrive is trained to the leave the five, you know. So they are out now. They, do, they don't have to be in the house anymore and they only want to see the, the normal. Um, even you know all the signs in the floors and everything, we are so used now to see them in supermarkets, shopping centers, and everything. That the hotels is not going to be, or the restaurants is not going to be any shop anymore for anybody, mm. because we are used now to queue, 
um, to keep the space, to keep the distance um, for a long, long time. It was surprised when we went first to the supermarket and we saw it there as well. And now it's a normal thing uh, to do it. So I, you will find few cases, even when they come in, you know, um, that they will be very, very uh, worry about everything like um, and with very specific requirements. And you will have another ones that um, they just want to, to to come back to what was in February. And talking about the public areas in as the cleaning of touch points, doors, as you mentioned, lifts, uh, bathrooms every hour or two hours. Um, in a large ground floor area such as your own, I presume that means having additional staff on from I believe early morning until 11 p.m. Is that right? I used to have myself before two public areas because of our meetings, but they will help in to clean rooms as well. From today, there is three public areas. So from 6.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, they will be all covered. Uh, so two, the early and the late will be only doing the ground floor. Um, and there will be another one that will be doing the back house. When I mean the back house, I mean like, the stairs, the lobbies on the floor, the staff toilets, the chaining rooms, and all these things. Now we start today as well, um, it's an app that all the public areas girls uh, and boys has with them in their mobile phone. And um, every time it's connecting to our, uh, one of the screens in the reception. So in the, in the screen, we have like um, ladies toilets, gents toilets, um, Logi, uh, the luggage trolley, the the hand, the handles of the doors, and there's one more. So every time that they clean that areas, they go to the app. Now, and they, it, when they look at the app, will be in a red button. So they put in the green button, and automatically in reception, it tells you that that area was cleaning one minute ago. So when they, after 30 minutes, that will change to in progress. So the guests can see as well how often we clean the different areas in the hotel because that is displayed in two televisions at reception. So that as well assures us for them that um, we are uh, cleaning. So um, the schedule that we have for the area that we have to cover is every 60 minutes. Every 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, Romy also commented to me about having a visible sign of sanitation. They're gonna have a lift host to direct people to the lift, reduce the numbers obviously and sanitize after each use. Um, but can I just come back to the bedroom, the room itself again, Inez, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm thinking of is, you know, it's gonna be, I guess, stripped of those extra pillows, you know, um, the excess hangers, tea and coffee making facilities and all the nice things like magazines and robes. Um, what, what, what is going to be taken out of rooms and um, all the magazine every paper or any if they have any information from the hotel any brochure or flyer or anything all of that is gone and um, the normal glasses are gone for plastic glasses um, myself personally i'm leaving the tea coffee facilities and they are in the press they are in a press so um they are protected only when they get taken out and they have to be disinfected like uh, and sanitize like uh, every, well before it was clean when the one chemical and now it's going to be clean with a different chemical but no difference of that a cushion throws everything that is out um, uh, in the bathroom toiletries um, or if the hotels that they have the the big uh, the 300 mil uh, toiletries well that has to be disinfected sanitized every day as part of uh, of their cleaning. And myself, I leave the bathrooms as well. Before I used to have two per room. Now we have only one and it's covered like the dry cleaning with the plastic of the of the dry cleaning. Um, if they request a second one, we will be delivering to the room uh, the second one. Like no pads, pens, all of that is gone from the rooms. But we have to think as well, um, we are a hotel we are not a hospital and we have to still give some of uh, the adventure of coming to a hotel. Um, no, like it, we can bring this as far as we, uh, as far as we wanted to bring it, you know, 
uh, but we still be in a hotel and I'm not a hospital. I'm sure if we compare any hotel in the country with the city west that has been used as a hospital um, for all this period will be totally different scenario, but we still a hotel and we have to uh, remain uh, as, as that. So uh, myself, I'm in that opinion. Um, what I'm hearing now here is that an awful lot of additional plastic waste uh, in, in our operations, and this is all having to be treated as general waste. Mary, this is a very big impact on recycling. What's your prediction for this uh, topic that we were very supportive of in our industry and we were really making progress? Yes, I would be loath, Michelin, to ask hotels to invest in uh, additional, more environmentally uh, friendly initiatives at this moment. God knows they're trying to make every penny count at the moment and they have an uphill battle in the immediate future. So I think if we have to use a little bit more plastic, that is the price that we may have to pay in the short term. Thanks, Mary. And Inez, initially, yeah. going to that, say, for example, a mask uh, for the staff, if you spend uh, a money to buy uh, reusable ones that you can wash them, in, in the end of the day, you're going to save money. Because if you, we provide the free uh, washable mask if, uh, to each staff, so that means they can bring them home as a part of the uniform, wash it as well, and bring them back. Uh, that no being used in uh, use, uh, one use mask all the time. So you're going to have a little bit of saving there as well to your waste uh, and also in the money that you spend because you only spend that money once. And so you're trusting your staff members to wash their uniforms at home and their masks at a yeah. high temperature. Yeah. Okay, okay. And as, uh, as president of the Irish Accommodation Institute, I know that you're communicating very strongly with members. And I'd like to just know how your members are planning to have their teams back to work um, in what is going to be quite a new experience for uh, frontline accommodation workers. Um, have staff been available, first of all, to come back to work? Um... A little bit of everything, Micheline. Myself, so far, I've been uh, lucky um, that everyone we have, co have called to come back, except I think one person who wanted to go off for a month, and we tell them, well, then you have to come back after uh, your holidays, because was working two days and after going on holidays. Uh, but generally, my, the, the staff here has no promise to come back. But I have heard from other members that uh, from people that are, they don't have babysitting, that or they don't have because the crashes um, are, cr are close or things like that, they don't have anyone who to mind the kids. Or people as well, I heard a couple of hotels that they have some staff that normally suffer, very easy to get uh, problems on the loans uh, with flu call. So obviously they try to hold them a little bit before they, they come back. But there is hotels where they are having difficulties to get the, the staff, uh, some of the staff uh, back. When they arrive, again, me, I've been very lucky because um, all the excitement of today, me, I, I have had it for the last three months. So I've been ready. I'm psychological. I've been, I prepare psychological already to this because believe it or not, you have to be ready psychological to see all the changes here as well. So when this staff come, it's like, I, I was the only accommodation, accommodation staff for nine weeks. So for me, when they come, it's, it's like I win the lotto because finally I have my, I, I have a staff with me. So when, when they see you like this, their, their attitude and their way to confront this is different as well because they see like in me, no fear, well, we have done this and everybody's going to do it. And that will make the difference. If they see you that you are worried about something, you're going to worry them. But if you, you know, they see you confident in the changes, even in the way, like Mary uh, mentioned earlier, uh, before we were cleaning, now we are disinfecting and sanitize. So you have to make them understand that as well. And so guys, we need to be very serious on this because we don't want somebody to get sick here an employee or, um, or a customer. So when they understand that, it's easier. I have seen them myself. They were good before, but now they are excellent. 
even in the way that they have cleaned the rooms the last week with me, or the way that they do public areas constantly now. The, is the fear, that's the part that as a manager, we have to show them that it's no fear. We just want to do the same job that we were doing before, but we need to put emphasis in another part that we weren't doing it before. Ines, are you um, pod working? You know, do you have dual teams? Um, at the moment, I only have few staff. So, and they actually funny enough that I only have few and they are all coming in a different times, like 6.30, 7 o'clock. But when, I, now, myself, I, I will have to have two teams only because we are not a huge hotel. But if I think in our hotels, for example, that they have 300 bedrooms and when the point came to, to get full and they need probably 25 staff, they're going to have to escalate them in different in different times. And um, our procedure at the moment is when they come in um, the temperature is checked and recorded for all of us. And after they wash their hands, they clock in and they go to change the uniform. So the staggered start times helps with the changing rooms and yeah. the, yes, yes. And we need to think that they're going to use common sense as well. Like there is signs outside the chaining rooms. If it's more than, our chaining rooms can, is comfortable to be three people with the distance. So, you know, if you have three people in the chaining room, please wait until somebody come out, you know. We have to trust them that they're going to use common sense as well. Um, to, to you know to follow the procedures. The same uh, up to yesterday we were having the, our lunch in the restaurant because we were in many people. From today we're going to use the canteen. So the first question I asked for my, for the accommodation staff when they were coming in, what time we have to go for lunch or what time is our breaks? Now at the moment it's fine because today we are not many staff. The canteen is very big, so we even if we all go at the same time we will have distance today. So I said, but they, they know and they are the first ones looking for that information on us. And so it's building confidence to have that information ready for them yeah. and a good, clear, uh, confident answer. Um, if, a, if a guest did uh, contract uh, COVID while staying in a hotel property, uh, what does the hotel need to have in place, Inez? What are you recommending to your members? Uh, we need, you need, well, we will never know actually if the guest has the, the, the COVID or no, because the only thing we can really check here is if it has the symptoms or if it has temperature, but we need to have a room uh, for the guest. And we have two at the ground floor level because, you know, it's close to reception. If an ambulance has to come, they don't even need to come to reception if they don't want. We can go to the end of the corridor and the ambulance, for example, can park outside. And so we have that two rooms only for that reason. And in the rooms we have uh, thermometers to take the temperature, glove, mask, everything. We have the, the, the questionnaire that we need to ask. So for, for uh, I heard hotels, I heard accommodation managers saying that their policy is uh, we only have a room in case a staff uh, has the symptoms. If the guest has the symptoms, has to stay in their, in their room. But what's happened, my question to that hotel is what's happened if the customer doesn't have a room? The customer has come for lunch, for example, or is attending a christening. Then you can't leave it in the room because they don't have a room. They're only coming for lunch. So it's necessary to have uh, the room. Uh, we have a COVID uh, team and three team leaders. And, but all the managers and assistant managers has been trained in the protocol uh, so we have temperature to check for every guest address as they come in. Uh, it's like a speed camera actually that takes your temperature and reflect it in a, in a television. If your temperature is more than 38, then a, noise, a beep will happen at one television that is in reception and they will approach the guests to sit down. If your temperature has a little bit high, wait for a few minutes because the guests could be coming, running from the bus and that's why he salit he has temperature, and after we take it from there, if the second time uh, the temperature has been high as well. Thank you so much, Inez. This has been a really fast-paced discussion, and we've covered so many current topics. I really want to say thank you uh, to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Inez. Thank you for joining me today. Um,
if any of our viewers would like to contact the uh, Institute of Accommodation uh, Managers, the Irish Accommodation Institute, to give it its correct title, uh, please get in touch with me and I will forward that to you, Inez. And also, if you would like to get in touch with Mary Hall from Hallmark Trailing, again, pop me an email and I'll send it on. Um, so um, for the next uh, couple of weeks I'm going to take a break um, but do join me on the firm Optimist when we return with more fascinating insights from our friends and our colleagues in the industry. I'll be keeping in touch on social media but until the next time goodbye for now and you can roll it there Greg. Thank you Micheline thank you very much. Thank you Micheline and good luck Ernest. Thank you Mary.